Hello everyone and welcome back to our MOA Live Talks uh, sessions. Uh, once again, I'm Dr. Heather Hatch and today we're going to be talking about a kind of a surface fun, but maybe uh, once you get a little bit deeper, not quite so fun uh, topic, which is pseudo-archaeology. So what is pseudo-archaeology? And I just got to move some things here so I can see what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> Pseudo-archaeology is stuff that sounds like archaeology, but doesn't really follow the methodology or standards of the discipline as a whole. Um, so this can encompass lots of things, from archaeological fakes, um, to attributions of elements of the archaeological record, to the work of mythical beings, um, belief in lost races of people, um, unification ideas, so the idea that um, certain uh, Technologies and ideas all come from the same place, um, and also related to this is hyperdiffusionism. So again, this idea that everything's spreading from the same place. Um, so this really, uh, which is yeah, the, the belief that cultural elements that appear in different cultures are really all somehow related. Um, so it's easy to dismiss a lot of this stuff as harmless or ridiculous nonsense. Um, but these kinds of pseudo-archaeological pseudo beliefs can actually be really harmful. Uh, quite frankly, they can be really uh, deeply racist, anti-Semitic, um, and they can be used in insidious ways to sort of spread other kinds of harmful ideologies as well, especially when they can be linked to other kinds of conspiracy theories. Um, so that is also something that happens with this sort of stuff. So pseudo-archaeology has been around for a long time, and there are some really famous examples of it that demonstrate some of the ways and the kinds of ways that it could be problematic and harmful. So today, pseudo-archaeology can be found all over the internet. Um, there are YouTube channels and like YouTube documentaries, television documentaries, websites, other kinds of social media platforms that are all dedicated to proving archaeological links to aliens, mythical um, civilizations. Um, there's even web pages that are dedicated to like long debunked archaeological fakes and so on and so forth. So for a long time um, it's had a home in sort of popular culture. So like the if you saw my, my splash image on um, the advertisement uh, for today's talk, I used the ancient uh, aliens TV show. God, aliens meme. Um, so it's, it's sort of been embedded there and it also gets linked a lot to or, or brought up a lot in popular culture as well because there it can be kind of fun to explore the idea that, you know, maybe there are ancient alien links to different civilizations, but in real life that can be more harmful. So why is it so appealing? So it's kind of like antiquarianism. So if you uh, saw my talk on that. Um, so it's that association with adventure, the thrill of knowing something that other people don't. And it's also this the general reason that conspiracy theories more broadly can be appealing. It makes you feel like maybe you're a part of an elite or a perceived elite. Um, and that can be really validating in an age where a lot of life feels really uncertain and people don't feel like they have a lot of power. So it creates an external focus for blame and relieves you of your responsibility in terms of like evaluating your world and also just it gives you something else to blame for your problems for example if you can say well there's this government conspiracy that's keeping us from being able to achieve whatever um so that's a lot of the the reasons that the people who promote these kinds of theories reinforce each other's work is to create that sort of sense of community um spirit so that people feel like um, they're all in this together against the world right so pseudo-archaeology, like other pseudoscience, is often based in, in faith and feelings and belief rather than actual science. So when that, and, and that's when it's not just a pure hoax that someone's created for fame or attention, or sometimes even just as a joke. Um, there are some pretty famous examples of archaeological fakes that started out as somebody basically playing a prank. Uh, they got really carried away. <laughs> um, and to be clear about this, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with having faith or even in believing in the possibility of things that we can't prove. So, but it's a different matter to claim that we're seeing evidence and that a scientific approach validates those beliefs, especially when the approach that's in question isn't even really science at all. Um, it just sounds like it. So people who are promoting these kinds of junk science want people to believe that they're telling it like it is and that they're letting ordinary people in on a secret that's usually obscured behind scientific jargon. 
but in truth, they're usually going about their science backwards. So they're collecting evidence that supports their beliefs and ignoring or dismissing anything that doesn't. So they're basically cherry picking what seem like facts to support what they want to believe or what they want other people to believe. And that dismissiveness is an important hint. They don't really want to engage with any interpretations or actual evidence that discounts their pet theories. In science, including archaeological science, hypotheses are tested with the intent to try and disprove them so that we can be sure that they're actually the best fit for all of the evidence we have and not just the parts we like. Um, so pseudo-archaeologists and pseudoscientists in general use a lot of language that sounds very authoritative and that sounds very certain. So they'll things like, clearly this is the truth, obviously, irrefutably. Um, and again, that gets that that's language and uh, an approach that is similar to a lot of other kinds of conspiracy theories. Um, and it also likes to call into question other more established authorities claiming that they don't want you to know the truth or that they're hiding facts or lying to um, further their own agendas, which is, a, you know, exactly the same kinds of tactics that the purveyor of these theories are actually employing themselves. <clears throat> so there's been a few notable archaeological fakes over the years, and these can kind of help set up the framework for how these are bad science and how they affect other kinds of like archaeological work and, and science that other people are trying to accomplish. So probably the most famous is what's known as Piltdown Man. I'm not going to go into the whole long history of it because it actually gets pretty complicated. Um, but what this is, is a case of a fossilized skull fragments of a human, a modern human, and the jaw of an ape were found together and they were thought or claimed initially on their discovery back in 1912 that they represented a single early human specimen. So they thought this was all from the same creature um, that represented a missing evolutionary link between apes and humans. And that's something that scientists had been looking for at that point, basically since the uh, Charles Darwin came in with his theory of evolution um, and people started sort of seeing these evolutionary um, connections, um, trying to look for early humans, right? So this was eventually debunked, but not really until the 50s. So like a good 40 years later, when somebody, when there had been already at that point enough discoveries of authentic early hominids, so early humans, to make Piltdown Man look more and more out of place. And also when scientists who were dubious about the claims about Piltdown Man were able to exert enough pressure on the museum that held the fossil to allow them to examine it more closely. So before that, it was basically locked away and only accessible to selected researchers who weren't trying to prove it was a fake. Um, so the team that was eventually allowed to examine it and subject it to more modern kinds of testing um, determined that the that it, it was in fact an ape jaw and human head or human cranial fragments, and that that jaw had actually been altered as had some of the artifacts that were found with it. So the jaw had been altered to make it fit better um, with the, the, the skull fragments that they had. Um, and the artifacts had been like stained, they'd been basically like painted to make it look like they came out of the right deposits to be the age that they wanted Piltdown Man to be. Um, <clears throat> and this was happening notably this was actually an English hoax, hoax, rather. So it was happening in England, and this was kind of related to some English nationalism. Like, they wanted the earliest humans to be English, right? So there was a lot of patriotism and national spirit sort of caught up in this, um, in this hoax as well. So it wasn't necessarily just about the, the, the specimen. It was about that sentiment as well. And it actually, uh, the Piltdown Man hoax had a significant impact because it was taken seriously by scientists at the time. Um, so they were trying to build out this theory about human evolution and what early man might have looked like and how it developed and evolved over time. Um, but they needed to fit this example that they had found that of Piltdown Man into that chronology. And they couldn't really do it, of course, because it was fake. So it didn't fit into what else, the other things that they were finding. But it caused a lot of confusion, it um, led to some bad analyses, and it sort of really like held back our ability to make actual uh, connections between the hominid fossils that we were finding. So in this case, it's a good example of how these fakes can be damaging, because it shows, um, it sort of shows that impact over time. And there was actually a paper, like this was such a significant hoax that people are still studying it now. And so there was a paper that came out in 2016, which like over a hundred years after it was found, um, 
that was looking at how that hoax was actually perpetrated. And uh, the, what the authors found is that it was actually probably one person, uh, Charles Dawson, who was the guy who claimed to have found it, who was responsible for creating the fakes. Um, and so in the abstract of their paper, um, which is the authors are Isabel de Groot et al. It's uh, a long scientific paper in a lot of these, um, especially uh, bioarchaeology papers, there tends to be like a long list of like 20 authors. But uh, Isabel de Groot was a primary author on this. Um, and in the, the abstract for the piper, uh, what they claim is that the, the Piltdown hoax stands as a cautionary tale to scientists not to be led by preconceived ideas, but to use scientific integrity and rigor in the face of novel discoveries. And that's really important. We have to take that sort of critical thinking approach to any kinds of new discoveries and question them to make sure, you know, that they fit the actual evidence, that there's not anything being withheld, and that we can sort of trust the conclusions that are being drawn from them also. And that's something that applies to all pseudo-archaeological claims, I mean also real archaeological claims. Um, if anyone is interested, I am going to link the paper in the comments when I'm finished speaking here. Um, <clears throat> so in the modern day, it's more difficult to come up with a new fake that actually stands up to scientific analysis. Uh, but they also, people who are per perpetrating these fakes in the modern day, and they certainly are, um, <laughs> the Nazca aliens being a great example of that. Um, <clears throat> So they generally do take a sort of page from that Piltdown Man playbook uh, by controlling the physical evidence, so only letting it be accessed by researchers that share, researchers rather, that share the same agenda as the her hoax's perpetrators, or people who have fully bought into the myth that they're being sold. So that's a really good hallmark of whether or not something is pseudoscience, or in this case pseudoarchaeology. Who is being allowed to examine the evidence and why? So related to what I was just saying, one of the really well, uh, more well-known pseudo-archaeological beliefs that's still really popular today is the belief that aliens, in which case I mean extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial outer space aliens, have been involved with human civilizations essentially since humans uh, got their start. Um, in some cases, the, this belief even is that you know humans came from extraterrestrials. Um, there's different variations, um, but one of the most famous iterations of this came from Eric von Dynekin's 1968 book, The Chariots of the Gods, sorry, Chariots of the Gods, this poses the question, Unsolved Mysteries of the Past. Uh, so he claimed that there are representations of alien visitations embedded in images and iconography from across the world in different time periods, and that even technologies to build monumental works like Stonehenge and the pyramids and um, pyramids across the world in different um, different styles of pyramids even were provided by ancient aliens um, and that the, all these different myths about uh, people engaging with with uh, gods or other people who came from the sky all represent ancient astronauts so aliens actually coming to visit modern or people of those times of those ancient cultures so his book and others like it like to draw parallels between ancient societies uh, provide alternative interpretations of icon of icon oh gosh I can't even talk today of iconography huh, um, that are outside the, the context of the broader iconographical framework um, and lead readers towards conclusions in in a ways that seem and feel logical from the way that they're being led but are really based on really deliberate misinterpretations or omissions of lines of evidence that contradict them however there are alternate uh, explanations for these images that have nothing to do with extraterrestrial influence um, or, you know, cultural contacts from people who didn't have the technology to cross oceans or whatnot. <clears throat> um, so to use a famous example, um, one of the most famous um, images that is talked about when we're, people are examining von Dynekin's work um, and his claims um, is, is a Mayan relief from a sarcophagus it shows a figure in an elaborate headdress climbing up this sort of structure or this ladder or whatever that it's above a fire and von Dynekin um, famously claims that this is an image of an ancient astronaut climbing up into his rocket ship but in fact Mayan scholars can actually explain every element of that iconography the headdress that this character is wearing um, what he's climbing which is in fact um, a Mayan depiction of the world tree that's very famous and common in Mayan iconography. Uh, the fire that they see below him is actually the underworld. And so what this actually represents um, is the deceased ruler whose sarcophagus this image came from is climbing up the world tree uh, 
basically to try and avoid falling into um, the underworld. And so this isn't just necessarily from the iconography, just, you know, comparative. There's actually texts that go along with this image in particular that describe what's being um, seen. So there is other interpretations and solid interpretations, but what this means, it has nothing to do with, with um, aliens, extraterrestrials, what have you. So Van Dyneken uses a lot more examples in his books and the two sequels to his books. Um, but again, there's other contextual explanations for all of these different elements that he's seeing and he's trying to create links between. Um, so he tries to uh, claim we don't have good evidence for things. So he talks about the Nazca lines um, in, in, for example, he's claiming that they're used as uh, some sort of ancient alien airfield. Um, the Nazca lines get a lot of attention because Archaeologists are still like legitimate archaeological interpretations of what they need. We know who made them. We know how they were made. Um, there's some really good solid theories about what they actually are. Um, but since archaeologists aren't necessarily in full agreement about what they represent or can't give a full explanation of what they mean, you know, that gives a lot of play area for people who want to come up with these different archaeological, pseudo archaeological theories about what they may mean. So <clears throat> the view that aliens had all these contacts and connections with alien cultures, and this explains the unexplained, um, and also <coughs> can, uh, explains different perceived commonalities between these cultures, like superficial comparisons of both Egyptians and Mayans had pyramids, for example, is a kind of hyperdiffusionism. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the belief that these common ideas and technologies that pop up in different parts of the world at different times all ultimately come from the same source. In this particular case, it's aliens. Um, but there's also the belief in lost races, like the Atlanteans, for example, is a popular one, who distributed their knowledge to the cultures of the world before disappearing. Um, sometimes they combine these in a nice uh, package by saying that the Atlanteans went back to space because they were, in fact, aliens. Um, <clears throat> so there's other examples of this hyperdiffusionism that clearly put into perspective the problem with these kinds of views. So there's a really delightful Facebook group um, that a friend of mine pointed to me to when I was preparing this talk that's called Fraudulent Archaeology Wall of Shame. Um, and it's dedicated to exposing all kinds of pseudo-archaeology. And uh, let me tell you that checking out that, that group was really eye-opening um, as to how prevalent these beliefs can be. And it's kind of scary, actually. Um, so one of the things that I saw linked there was a meme that had originally been posted to a different Facebook group, which is called Ancient Wonders of Archaeology, Art History, and Architecture, which sounds fine. Um, but it sh what it showed, this meme, was um, both images of statues with blue eyes from across different cultures around the world, again from different times, along with what the creator was clearly interpreting as different variations of the swastika, also from different cultures, places, and around the world, leaving the reader, leading, really, the reader, to conclude that perhaps there was a blue-eyed master race that disseminated genes and ideology throughout the world in ancient times. So yeah, it's super racist. Um, and it actually is linked back to pseudo-archaeological beliefs that influenced Nazi thinking about the superiority of the Aryans. <laughs> um, so this is really gross. And not only um, in, this, in, this, in this particular example, of a uh, really white supremacist revisionism, which is what the person who posted it to the group called it accurately. Uh, but there's all kinds of these attributions to like lost ma uh, master races or lost races or even just aliens implies that the cultures who actually produce these works and symbols, architecture, whether it be Mayans or Egyptians, other African or South American civilizations were not actually responsibility or responsible for their own accomplishments. So it supports a view that the people behind them, like the actual living people, um, or sorry, I guess not living anymore, but their descendants, um, weren't actually capable of understanding complex ge geography. They weren't capable of putting together the infrastructure that was needed to build monumental um, structures. Or they weren't smart enough to develop ways of doing complex mathematical co calculations. So if it makes more sense to you that aliens or some other group that came from half a world or further away to teach these simple savages how to do these things, um, well, to be pol the, the polite about it, you're really not giving people enough credit and you're not giving the peoples of those cultures or their descendants enough credit either. So it's not really a coincidence that aliens get used to explain like pre-Columbian accomplishments or the pyramids 
or the Nazca Lines, and not things like the Roman Forum or the Parthenon. It's the same kind of thinking that led early American settlers to believe in a lost European civilization who had traveled to North America previously and who were the ones who built the mounds across the landscape that they were encountering, encountering including at places like the city of Cahokia in Illinois. And it was because they didn't believe that the indigenous population was capable of um, producing these kinds of monumental works. And then they used this ideology, this belief in a lost European civilization, as an excuse to remove those people from their own lands. So not only is it racist, not only is it really colonialist to sort of view people in this way, but these can, this kinds of pseudoscience can actually enable racist policy that causes significant harm to living populations. So it's bad science, and it's also just bad. Um, so there's really way too many um, pseudo-archaeological theories out there for me to touch on all of them, or even all of the major themes in the sort of the time frame that I have set for this. Um, <clears throat> But if something, if you're looking, if you're reading something, if you encounter it on the internet, you're watching it on TV, it sounds a little off. There's some critical thinking tools that we can apply to help us evaluate those claims. So these are ones that I took from a website called pseudoarchaeology.org, which is a site that a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Stephen Chrisomalis, put together for a course he taught way back in like 2007. Um, but they're still pretty useful. So here is some of the things you can say if, if, it, if it meets these or if it doesn't meet the criteria, whatever, then you're probably looking at something pseudo-archaeological. Pseudo so the first is, it doesn't cite the sources of the facts that's offered as evidence for the theories. So if it's talking about, you know, where these ideas come from, it's claiming them uh, to be, like, accurate, true facts, but it's not telling you where they actually came from, that's a red flag. If it does not cite scholarship outside of a small circle of supporters. So if it's really only drawing on the research or scholarship, if you want to call it that, of uh, other people who buy into this theory, and it's not letting, not engaging with any external criticism, that's also a red flag. Um, if it doesn't make the concepts or assumptions of the research itself undertaken clear to the audience, so if it's not really telling you like what questions it's, it, that are being asked, um, how they're actually doing any research on this, also a red flag. If it does not address criticisms or contradictory evidence except dismissively. So if it's not really like g getting into the meat of how things are being critical, um, if they're just saying like, yeah, people don't like this and they're dumb, um, or they're wrong, or they're hiding something, um, that's also a red flag. If it does not include well-supported chronological, sorry, chronological or spatial evidence for archaeological materials. So a lot of archaeological fakes, for example, including Piltdown Man, are the sort of thing where we, there's no real, um, context. So it all comes back to that whole archaeological context question, right? So if we know where something came from precisely, we can um, make a lot more about the, or we can say a lot more about its relationships um, in terms of where it was discovered, um, like what is the age of those deposits, what else was it found with, what other kinds of things have been found in those in similar deposits, and that kind of information can help us um, analyze and understand what we're looking at. So if that data doesn't exist, if they're like, oh, some miner found this head in a cave and brought it to me and clearly it proves whatever, um, <clears throat> then that's um, maybe not really strong spatial evidence or strong chronological evidence. If there's no dating or if the dating that's been done is really questionable, um, all these kinds of things can help us evaluate the validity of a scientific claim. So if it doesn't even include evidence, or if it's really sketchy, um, it's not detailed, then again, that's a red flag. Um, if it relies on outdated or antiquated theories and evidence without examining recent scholarship on the subject. So for example, um, with uh, the Van Dynekens stuff, um, that was published like a good 50 years ago. So people are going to that as their source material and they're not looking at all of the criticism that's been done of his work since then, then that's an indication that maybe they're not really actually willing to engage in criticism of this theory, right? So <clears throat> you, you want people to be up to date on the material that they're studying so that they can incorporate more recent criticism of those ideas because otherwise they're just going in a circle and reiterating these sort of problematic views. So if it fails to include information on the nature, 
time and methodologies of any research conducted in the collection of evidence. So if they're not telling you how it was collected, how long it took, you know, um, <clears throat> like what the approach was, if that information isn't there. So again, this comes back to archaeological field methods, for example, how we record things very carefully. So if that information isn't available, that's also kind of a red flag because, um, if you're trying to use an, uh, an object or a find to like ground a new theory, um, you really want to have solid evidence that you can demonstrate um, about its provenance or where it came from. So if it uses unfalsifiable theories that can neither be verified nor disproven through further collection of evidence. So if you're like, oh yeah, it came from this place that has been completely destroyed since nobody can go back there, haha, -ha, um, that's not really a strong argument in the favor of the authenticity of the find. Um, so, or if you're saying, if you're putting uh, something forward and say, well, you can't really disprove this. Like, I believe that this is something that was presented here by aliens and here's my reasons, but there's not really a way that you can sort of question that and like actually ask, you know, test those hypotheses. Then again, uh, that's not really solid science. <clears throat> So if it uses an overconfident writing style that does not permit any uncertainties, then like, again, if we're saying like, obviously this, there can be no doubt, irrefutably, it was aliens. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of something you should also be aware of and consider a red flag. Um, obviously a lot of writers do like to be pretty certain of their conclusions, uh, <clears throat> but you want to take all these things sort of together um, and that sort of not leaving space for there to be criticism even um, can be a red flag that something is maybe not really great archaeological science. Uh, so if it relies on unrepeatable or impressionistic observations of archaeological materials like well it made me feel this way uh, for example that's not science. I mean that can be a belief you can feel a connection to an object or a site or whatnot but that doesn't necessarily mean that those feelings are you know, something you should be applying to everyone's experience um, or that you should be using to to uh, formulate whole theories about the ancient world. Um, <clears throat> so if it employs irre irrelevant or gratuitous images to support a theory, so if you think back to the meme I was describing, it just sort of put all of these images together um, and sort of use that visualization to sort of help or try and get people to, to draw a particular conclusion, even though there's no context, um, there's no explanation for what these, uh, like where these images came from, what they're meant to represent, what the iconography that they're using is actually representative of, so that none of that was there. It's just, here's some images and here's my theory, right? So if it's not really related, uh, that's also a red flag. If it's using the theory's popular appeal, um, or popularity is evidence for its correctness. Like, so many people believe that aliens, ancient aliens have this. How can so many people be wrong? Lots of ways. And conversely, <clears throat> if they're using their theory's lack of popularity as evidence of a reactionary or conspiratorial uh, forces uh, acting against um, such new ideas of their own. So if, you know, they're like, ah, oh, yes, nobody believes this because the government is suppressing this evidence of alien interference in the past, that's also kind of a red flag. So if they're saying that nobody believes this because it's being suppressed, um, you might want to consider that there might be other reasons why that this particular theory isn't being given a lot of uh, validation um, and maybe apply some of these other critical thinking tools to it to decide whether or not you think it's because there's some kind of conspiracy in the establishment or maybe it's just bad science. <laughs> Um, and then final one here is if it cites, thanks, or mentions academic authors to boost the credibility of their work without actually describing the nature of this support. So if it's just like, yes, thank you to my good friend, famous anthropologist, um, and then doesn't say, you know, who actually thinks that this is completely valid and, you know, supports my work or whatnot, um, or you are unable to actually provide a citation, um, it, who knows what that actually means. Maybe they're like, yeah, you know, Sure, person who sent me a crazy email, thanks for that. And you know, maybe that's enough to provide support to a theory. Um, it, people, I, I know plenty of people in academia um, who get these kinds of 
um, engagements with people who have sort of really creative theories about um, different things that they're encountering um, who are seeking that kind of validation from the academia. And if you're not careful in how you respond to those, it can be taken as support. So what that actually means when somebody's claiming that somebody has backing their work or whatnot, um, you want to be careful about that um, if they're not actually providing citations or whatnot. So those are just a bunch of red flags. Um, and again, I can put a link to, <clears throat> to these criteria in the comments as well for anyone who's interested. And these are some good criteria. They can help you think through and evaluate the actual scientific approach and also give you some ways to work through some of the other claims that are being made. So you can make a more informed decision about whether or not you want to believe things to which maybe more valid archeological research can provide a solid explanation. And it's important, it's especially important when these kinds of things get serious attention in the media from journalists who might just be list, looking for an uh, interesting or sensationalist story who don't themselves have the, uh, the tools available to um, really evaluate the validity of some of these pseudo archeological claims or when they get airtime on places like the History or the Discovery Channel uh, where they might get paired with programs that have a little bit more substance and authority to them. Um, so this sort of juxtaposition of these pseudo-archaeological, pseudo-scientifical, or pseudo-scientific approaches um, with other more valid, like, documentaries can lead people to the assumption that they have that same authority themselves. <clears throat> so today's internet culture makes it, as I was saying at the beginning of this, makes it really easy for anyone to have a platform, whether it's a web page or a YouTube channel, and it gives people uh, easy access to uh, platforms to spread these ideas and to hook their audience. And it's also really dangerous because it's easy to get tied up with other kinds of damaging, also often racist, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, like that the government is covering things up, or that the government is aliens, or lizard people, or whatnot. So these things kind of, um, they can lead into each other, especially if you're looking at a platform like YouTube, which just sort of reinforces um, your viewing um, habits, right? So it starts to sort of tunnel you towards more extreme views over time. <clears throat> there was actually, when I was reading this, uh, a piece that was talking about somebody's father who started off with sort of a curiosity and interest in sort of aliens in general and that concept, watching a lot of ancient aliens re regularly and getting involved in different comment boards and so forth and eventually like just becoming a full on subscriber to the QAnon conspiracy theory that's pretty frighteningly popular these days. Um, so these things can like lead to other kinds of damaging um, beliefs. And again, it goes back to that idea of feeling like you have a community of people who support you in your beliefs um, and feeling uh, like you have some special knowledge um, and that the problems in your life are not necessarily your own fault. And they can be attributed to some sort of outside forces, right? But it's also just kind of bad for archaeology when people can't tell the difference between pseudo-archaeology and fringe theories and actual research. So fortunately, there have always been people who are willing to commit to standing up to these archaeological myths. There are some good books that take a crack at some of these more, more famous ones, uh, like ones, and there's groups like the one I mentioned before. Uh, there's blogs like Jason Covalito's. Um, there's articles published in places with popular reach like Archaeological Ma Magazine that are all aimed at helping com uh, people combat these pseudo-archaeological perspectives from fakes to fringes to conspiracy theories. Um, the example of the Mayan astronaut relief actually came up just last year in 2019 um, in an episode of the podcast The Joe Rogan Experience, uh, which resulted in an article in Science written by Lizzie Wade that explores the archaeological responses to these kinds of theories. And I'll also link that in the comments. And again, like this is uh, an idea that came out in a book over 50 years ago now um, that's still seen in some circles as being valid. In this particular case in the podcast, there was some questioning about the, this idea and this, this visual interpretation of it. And so it was really put out as a question to archeologists who responded um, to the podcast about, you know, th that this was in fact a problematic interpretation and why. Um, but again, I'll link that article in the comments and people can read it for themselves if they're interested. So one of the other ways that archaeologists can help to combat these kinds of fringe theories um, is by making the results of their own research more widely accessible. So part of the reason that these theories can thrive is because it's hard for people to get access to what's actually being done in contemporary archaeological research. 
So <clears throat> the more that that is available, so people can have something to compare it to, um, to have provided these other um, interpretations to understand the broader context of particular um, images or um, instances of technology and so forth that they're seeing, um, they can have a chance to encounter that with a, a stronger grounding and scientific knowledge uh, and scientific analysis and archaeological interpretation. Um, that can be really helpful. And that's one of the things that we're happy to be able to help to do here at the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, um, is to provide a more public friendly experience of the archaeological research that's being done in Ontario. And, you know, as much as we just want people to understand what archaeology is, what's being done and so forth, like being able to provide that platform of, of that broader context for some of these interpretations to help people understand what archaeology is, and to just have a different authoritative voice explaining it to them is something that we're, we're happy to be able to do and is again important in being able to provide an alternative <coughs> to these pseudo archaeological beliefs. So thank you everyone. I hope that was interesting. I've got a couple of links to drop in the comments. Um, I'm also going to drop as ever a link to our donations page. So if anyone would like to help support uh, this talk series or just the general work that we're doing at the museum, uh, we really would appreciate it. Um, and then on Thursday, I believe we're going to have Dr. Neil Ferris again uh, with a presentation for you about um, some of the research that's been done um, at the Lawson site. So I know Katie talked a little bit about the history of the site. I think this is going to take a little bit more of uh, a twist into like what has actually been done there in terms of archaeological research as well. So I hope that you will join us for that and thank you and have a great afternoon.